Good evening, everyone. There will still be people trickling in. I know class gets out around 6, so people have to eat. Um, but thank you for coming tonight. Before we get started, um, I'd like to sort of point out first the GSD's official uh, land acknowledgement. Um, and to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the traditional land of the Massachusetts people who have stewarded this land for generations. And while I and probably you understand that a simple acknowledgement cannot repair the deep harm caused by colonization, it is an important step in recognizing the ongoing relationship between land, history, and people. And so I encourage all of us to consider how we each can contribute in tangible ways with tangible actions to support indigenous communities in meaningful ways. Um, I'd also take, uh, like to take a moment to welcome our audiences, both in person, but also uh, virtually online. Um, a quick reminder that we do have uh, live caption available tonight. Um, so to enable that caption, click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the live stream window. Um, for in-person audiences, um, live captioning is also available if you'd like. Um, and that QR code should bring you to a link um, so that you can get that uh, real-time closed captioning. Um, please visit the AV booth in the back if you need assistance, and Matt will help you out. All right. There's lots of events here at the GSD. If you're new here, you are discovering that every night of the week can be the most exciting night of the week, like tonight. Um, so just to give you a sort of heads up of a couple things, next Thursday, September 19th, uh, we'll be hosting a screening of Perfect Days, which is a film by Wynne Wenders that follows the life of a toilet cleaner in Tokyo. Um, this screening is coordinated with the fall studio Flush, uh, waste and Intimacy in Berlin's Civic Realm as a part of the first in a series supported by the Koji Yanai Innovative Infrastructure Initiative Fund. Say that three times fast. Uh, that week, September 20th, through 22nd, um, you'll also be invited to the GSD Comeback, a celebration of the school's alumni and friends. Um, so, Please, if your students here, meet some folks that used to go here, talk to them about their experience, where they are in life now. Um, it's a good opportunity to meet folks, to share stories, to network, um, all of the things that um, you're not doing when you're in class, but are also important to your experience here. So tonight's event um, is also this year's Margaret McCurry Lecture. The Margaret McCurry Lectureship in the design arts was established in 2000 to honor Margaret McCurry for her long-standing service to the GSD and to Harvard University more broadly. A native of Chicago, McCurry is the principal of Tigerman McCurry Architects um, and also has designed furnishings, fabrics, and accessories. McCurry has been active both locally and nationally, serving as the chair of the AIA Committee on Design, director of the Harvard Alumni Association, and president of the GSD Alumni Council. Uh, her work has earned numerous AIA and ASID design awards um, and has also been widely published. And here we are tonight. Um, I'm now very pleased to introduce my friend, Shalina Odbert. Um, today, we're going to explore how design, a field often associated with aesthetics and function, has a critical but often overlooked role in shaping inclusion, justice, and equity in our public spaces. Design disciplines, especially where environmental and urban systems intersect, are uniquely positioned to address issues like inequality and injustice. However, traditional design practices often fall short, serving priorities of those with access to capital and leaving marginalized communities yet underrepresented. Shalina Odbert is founder and executive director of Kunkoi Design Initiative, KDI, a nonprofit that brings together urban planning, landscape architecture, research, and community organizing to create a more just public realm. 
From her time as a student here at the GSD, Shalina believed in a different approach to design, one that centers communities rather than just paying clients. Her career has taken her from designing high-end residential projects to now working in informal settlements in Kenya and addressing issues of equity and social justice in urban and rural communities in Southern California. Shalina's groundbreaking work has earned her recognition from respected institutions such as the United Nations and the Aspen Institute, just to name a couple. Her firm, KDI, has been awarded the 2021 Emerging Voices Award um, from the Architectural League of New York and the 2022 National Design Award in Landscape Architecture from the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Museum. Again, just to name a couple. Through projects like the Kibera Public Space Project in Kenya, um, one of the founding projects, um, and El Nino Flood Mitigation Initiative in California, KDI has transformed both international and local communities by blending environmental solutions with social impact. Shalina is also an influential educator, having taught here at the GSD, at UCLA, at the Claremont Colleges. Her contribu contributions to the field extend also into publications like the World Bank Handbook on Gender Inclusive Urban Planning and Design and other influential works. I first met Shalina at an open house for admitted students. Um, we were actually met on the stairs coming down to the chow house and we did some selfies the other day just to commemorate the moment. Um, and I was really debating whether or not this school was right for me. It is a little bit big, a little bit corporate. Um, but Shalina reassured me that despite the size and despite the sort of um, outward atmosphere of the GSD, that there are valued aligned people here. Um, and, we, and that working in a resource rich environment could actually provide the tools that make meaningful change possible. Um, a little bit of thinking about how we work from within while others are working from without. We've stayed connected ever since and we'll be doing some uh, research on housing uh, in Coachella Valley in LA um, with some money we got from Berkeley recently, so I'm excited to do that. So today, Shalina will share her unique journey discussing the challenges and opportunities of leading a mission-driven practice and showcase some of KDI's flagship projects that demonstrate what a more just and inclusive public realm can look like when communities are at the heart of the process. Please join me in welcoming Shalina Odbert. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Anne, and thank you, Diane, Maurice. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight. It is always a pleasure to be back at the GSD, and I think it is fair to say that I really owe the GSD a thanks on behalf of not just myself, but everyone who's been a part of KDI, several of whom are here tonight, um, because without the GSD, it's pretty uh, fair to say that KDI might not be here today. So thanks for the invitation, but thanks even more for all of the foundational work that uh, you've poured into us and other students to make practices like ours possible. So I'd like to start tonight's lecture with a question. What is 20 years of life worth? While this may seem like a bit of a personal question for a design lecture, it turns out it's more relevant to our practice than you might imagine. That's because the person that gets to answer that question isn't you or me, it's actually not a person at all. It's your zip code. If you live on the Upper East Side of New York, you're likely to enjoy 90 years of life. If you live a few blocks over in East Harlem, you'll have just 71. In Kansas City, Missouri, if you live on the west side of Troost Avenue, you're likely to live to the age of 79. And if you live on the east side of Troost Avenue, you're likely to live to 64. And what the data makes plain is these 15 to 20 year discrepancies don't have anything to do with how you answered my first question. They have little to do with genetics or even your quality of healthcare. 
These discrepancies have everything to do with access. Specifically, you live 19 years longer on the Upper East Side or 15 years longer west of Troost because you have access to three things. The first is social infrastructure, things like schools, public spaces, community centers, and cultural institutions, which in turn create access to opportunity and income. Access to safety, including safe streets, safe and affordable housing stock, safe transportation networks. And access to a healthy environment, the ability to live away from environmental hazards like landfills, clean water and sanitation, and the ability to withstand climate disasters. We also know that it doesn't seem to matter where you are on the planet. The division between those communities that have access to these three things and those that don't is drawn along lines of race, ethnicity, and income across the country and around the world. I first understood this, albeit in a far less scientific way, growing up in Sacramento. I spent my days shuttling between two realities, the working class Latinx community my grandparents and extended family lived in, where the only park that existed was off limits because of the state of disrepair it was in. And then the manicured planned communities of my parochial school friends, where there were three parks within a five minute walk. Though I seemed to ask my grandmother the question weekly, why I could only go to the park when I was at my friend's house, I never got a satisfying answer. What she certainly never told me is that these disparities are designed. In the summer of 2005, six rather, five of my GSD classmates and I understood this implicitly as we stood here in Kenya at the wall that divides the Royal Nairobi Golf Course from the informal settlement of Kibera. The question that brought us here was top of mind. If this disparity is by design, can our design training also be a part of the solution? For the last 15 years, we've been working to answer that question through a Penny White project turned practice called KDI. As Stephen shared in his introduction, KDI is a nonprofit design and community development firm focused on working with communities to build what we call a just public realm. We're an interdisciplinary team that combines the best of engineering, landscape, organizing, architecture, and planning to bring the power of good design to places where it isn't often found. We work from four offices in three countries. Some of my colleagues past have just joined this year's co cohort in landscape. And we work in about a dozen other places in between. And what 15 years of practice in Kibera and elsewhere has told us is that not only can design be useful in undoing disparities to help people live better and longer, but it has a responsibility to. Because this list is not a list of things that doctors create. It's a list of things that we, the people in this room, are on the front lines of shaping. This sense of responsibility is actually what brought me to the GSD. You see, just before I came to Cambridge, I was working in high-end interior design in Los Angeles on fantastic budgetless projects for a great firm that collaborated with the best architects and landscape architects. I really loved the creative process and all that I was learning about the power of design. But the more time I wielded design's power in these spaces of privilege, the more compelled I was to figure out how to use that power everywhere else. So I applied to the GSD, intent on reorienting design to the places I cared about most, places like my family's neighborhood. And it was a good time to be on such a mission here. SOCA, which was social change and activism at the time, was in full force, asking faculty to expand the curricular offerings to include topics of design and social justice. And the faculty were interested in doing just that. The idea of ditch urbanism put forward by Michelle Provost seemed to suggest that a place-based mode of practice was at least worth a try. And there was Jim Stockard, 
former director of the Loeb and all around great human, who told me on admitted students day, much like the message I then passed on to Stephen, that the students at the GSD have more power to get things done that I might first recognize. One just needed to seek out like-minded people and call on the resources of Cambridge to get pretty much anything done. And that bit of advice is basically the story of how KDI was born, a story that I'll share in four quick beats, though I've told it a hundred times before, because I think it's a basic out, as a basic outline, it's a useful how-to for anyone in this room that's interested in pursuing a road less traveled. The first step is find your people. In our case, a group of classmates with architecture, landscape, and urban planning programs backgrounds found their way to each other. Then we received a two-week Penny White grant to explore a burning question about design's relevance to the world's biggest challenges. We took our question to Kenya, where Arthur, one of the crew, was from, and then to Kibera, an informal settlement the size of Central Park, home to about 300,000 people. It was there that we hit this wall of hard truths. Among them was that we were silly to think we could do anything meaningful in Kenya in just two weeks. Luckily, two of us had a year left of school, so we put Jim Stockard's advice to work and began to weave together every useful resource in Harvard and Cambridge to create a real project in Kenya and to contemplate a different mode of practice. In that last year of school, we designed a project to build in Kibera through a joint thesis. We got it funded through a social enterprise incubator at the Kennedy School. We wrote a business plan across the river. And we took a course at MIT to try to learn a thing or two about water. Then the third step. We did as Michelle Prost suggested and put a fact on the ground. After we graduated, we went back to Kenya and with our partner in residence from the summer before, we got to work building our first project. It was this riverine space reclaimed and reimagined through a community process and transformed by residents into a hub of physical, economic, and social infrastructure, a productive public space, we called it. We eventually got jobs, but continued working in, on Kibera projects in our free time. As one project became two, and two had the potential to be three, there came a moment where someone would either have to quit their job and do KDI full time, or we would wind down our efforts after the second project was complete. And that's when it came time to take the leap. I happily quit, and in 2010, with support from community members, a community member in Kibera, and an engineer from Bureau Happold, we set out to build a practice. As we continued to build the public space network in Kibera, we also began to think about expanding our model to other places like it that were in my backyard. First, the Eastern Coachella Valley, where like Kibera, drinking water is contaminated, sanitation is precarious, insecure access to food is abundant, and open space is an afterthought. But also like Kibera, entrepreneurial know-how is high, community networks are strong, and local culture is thriving. These were the assets we would build upon to address the challenges residents prioritized. From there, we started to work in Los Angeles and on to my actual home, where the same challenges exist among far too many of the communities in the metropolitan area, alongside of some of those same great assets. In each place, we started with almost a literal translation of the work in Nairobi. We reclaimed an underutilized waste space through a community-driven process to create a much-needed public space prioritized by residents. In Coachella, that first project even shared the same name as the Kenya project, the Eastern Coachella Valley Productive Public Space Network. Our first public space in the network was here in the community of North Shore, a farm worker community not too far from where the Coachella Music Festival takes place. Together with residents, we transformed this site into a five-acre park 
the first park in a 20 mile radius. And then in LA, where we understood that half of the city didn't have access to parks, we tried to replicate this process again. But quickly we realized that reclaiming land in the city would be neither fast nor cheap. So we adapted this model to reclaim the one thing that LA has plenty of, which are streets. We worked to create a play streets program with LA Department of Transportation where residents could apply to have a park in a box that we also designed come to their communities for the day on a recurring basis and transform the street into a place of community gathering. Then with that first public space project up and running in each of our three core geographies, a strange thing started to happen in every one of those communities. Our community partners started to identify adjacent needs and projects that they wanted to address next. Needs around mobility and environmental justice, supporting that claim that I laid out at the beginning of the lecture, that for all of us to live better, longer lives, we need not just social infrastructure, but access to safety and access to a healthy environment. Because we had this interdisciplinary structure, we were able to stretch across these adjacent topics and scales, and over time it's led to an important realization about how to deliver our mission. In our work, justice begins at the scale of the project. But our work is then to follow that path that the community defines instead of the path defined by the RFPs to create meaningful clusters of change. Let's look at a few of these paths and the clusters they create to answer the question posed in the talk description. What could a more just public realm look like? We'll start in Kibera. With that first public space project that I shared earlier, it was designed to meet the priority needs that residents identified during our Penny White trip. Safe places for kids to play, income generating opportunities close to home, clean water and sanitation, but it was clear to us that one project, even a great one, wouldn't address any of these issues that we were seeing at scale. And so that first project was always, from the early days of our thesis, imagined as part of a network of semi-permanent spaces throughout the settlement. Today, the Kibera Public Space Project is a network of a dozen riverine waste spaces like these ones that have been reclaimed and transformed through a community design process. They provide things like playgrounds, community halls, gardens, vending and water kiosks, and sanitation centers. All sites also include strategies for repairing the riparian zone and establishing flood control. Residents also build and manage the sites, being trained in new skills along the way and each site generates enough income to pay for ongoing maintenance. With each site built, residents also had adjacent concerns around circulation. Lack of pavement, steep topography, and no formal street lighting meant that without improved circulation, access to the site would be limited to those that were able-bodied and would exclude those that were not. This was the case with our fifth site shown here. We were only able to make modest improvements to circulation in the original project, but in 2021 when the Kenyan government became a pro began a process to build a road near the site, we saw an opportunity to do more. We began a bargaining process with the agency who was planning to design a road that would be too steep and too dangerous for a car to use. We offered to trade our engineering expertise to help them reroute the road for their support in building a multi-beneficial green street where the road would have been. From there, an engagement process, a ramping study, and ultimately a design that accommodates several amenities and a new drainage channel de designed to accommodate a 100-year flood. The project was constructed over the course of seven months. And the resulting impact is a pedestrian friendly space that allows for social gathering, economic exchange, and an increase in perceived and physical safety. 
The project also importantly now serves as a strong example to the Kenyan Road Authority to integrate inclusive public spaces within infrastructure planning for better, more holistic outcomes. The other thing about Kibera is that much of it is in high exposure flood areas. Loss of life and property are a regular occurrence every rainy season. With each site that we built, the most costly, complex, and time-consuming part of each project was the question of flooding and flood control. A couple projects in, instead of continuing to respond to flooding by building these intense systems of gabions at each site, residents wanted to take a step back and understand the issues of flooding more comprehensively. The first round of work was a rigorous, community-engaged data collection process and mapping effort, something that no agency in the city had ever done, to really understand what was driving flooding. There were some very surprising findings, including the idea that some of the most intense flooding wasn't coming from the river, but coming from the drainage system or lack thereof. We also learned that most of the best practices for nature-based solutions to flooding, the things you can do in Portland, for example, weren't real options for cities like Nairobi. This was disappointing, but undeterred, we began to test different types of solutions to flooding that would respond to existing form, first in three test sites within Kibera. Things like this planted flood attenuation system were very successful and served as the first and contextually appropriate precedence in the city. Which led us to a larger project, RUNBS, a project expanding the set of nature-based solutions in both quantity and geography. The project grew to seven other settlements across the city, and now we have a collection of nearly 100 nature-based solutions and strategies. Designed and built with residents, there's Martha. And we're evaluating these across the city to inform work with Nairobi's Public Works Agency. This work has recently been expanded to Tanzania. And then the last stop on this path is a full circle stop. A dozen years after we started the Productive Public Space Network, we were invited to scale our original public space model beyond Kibera to other informal settlements in Nairobi through a project called the Urban Fabric Initiative with the Kenyan government and the French Development Bank. In it, we're supporting community groups in five different settlements to begin public space networks of their own. The first set of projects are in construction now. So each cluster builds impact in its original geography, but it also builds knowledge for both our community partners and us as a practice. And this is knowledge that we can export and adapt to other similar communities where we are rooted. This next cluster is a case in point. In the Eastern Coachella Valley, there is also a growing network of public spaces that look and operate much differently from the sites in Kibera, but are also improving economic opportunity, social cohesion, and environmental resilience across this farm worker valley. We began work on the North Shore project because residents had been advocating for parks for years with no material success. The five acre park they eventually designed now stands not only as an iconic park that celebrates in big and small ways the rich culture of the predominantly Mexican community, but also as an example of an alternative park financing model that we designed and as a streamlined permitting process that we helped create. A few years later, and just a 10 minute drive away, we opened the first phase of a 14 acre park designed with residents of the community of Oasis, utilizing that same financing structure and permitting process that we had put in place for the North Shore Park. And then later we secured state funding for a third park in the neighboring community of Thermal. 
More recently, we've begun to work on two more public spaces in the network, this time partnering with the Torres Martinez tribal community, whose land is checkerboarded across the valley, to design an open air cultural learning space at a site that was once under, underwater and still contains intact tribal etchings and ancient fish traps. And at a second site, that will be the first recreational park the tribe has ever built. Again, we used a process along with tribal members to co-design the space that will uplift culture, sports, and ecology and use the financing processes that we developed to bring these projects to life. But as in Kibera, quickly into our work on parks, residents very clearly told us we were overlooking something important, mobility. Most people in the valley have only one car. It's used by the primary breadwinner. And at the same time, the roads have no sidewalks, no street lighting, no bike lanes, and no shade. So this is a very dangerous way to try to access the parks on foot. Residents told us that without a safe way to get to the parks, the parks would not have their full impact. Sound familiar? They wanted to get to work on that next. So we approached Riverside County Transportation. This was who would need to adopt the plan to make it viable for state funding. They agreed, and we worked with residents to develop and adopt three neighborhood mobility plans in the various unincorporated areas that prioritized pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. With these plans, plans officially in place, we were then eligible to apply for and win implementation funding for active transportation improvements. From our mobility work, we began to also understand and explore the heat impacts of the Desert Valley. Anecdotally, there was no question that it was hot but anecdotes don't get the attention of decision makers. So we began to work with UCLA and the Oasis Leadership Committee, a resident group formed in the design of the Oasis Park, pulling from the model of community partnership that we developed in the public space network in Kibera, to gather the data needed to prove the case. <clears throat> with that data in hand, residents were eager to act. So we took on a quick, small-scale project around bus stops, where currently all bus stops in the eastern Coachella Valley have no shade, and the wait can often exceed an hour in temperatures over 100 degrees. Again, we worked with residents, you get the pattern here, to co-design and prototype a shelter. We built it and installed it, having to call it an art installation because of some obscure permitting process that said you could not have a bus shelter at a bus stop if there were no sidewalks in front of the bus stop. Anyway, we got the attention of all of the local politicians, the news outlets, and the bus line itself. These two shade projects then armed us with the political will and the clarity of data needed to act at the regional scale. And so now, again, together with UCLA and the OASIS Leadership Committee, who now acts as an independent organization and as a partner on these research grants for their own funding and their own scope of work, we're leading a shade equity master plan for the region to lay out not just where shade should go, but to explore all of the natural, man-made, and hybrid ways where we can create, that we can create shade corridors. This will be the first such plan for a rural area and only the fourth shade master plan in the world. So we spent the first few years in the Eastern Coachella Valley building relationships and the community power needed to take on the environmental hazard looming over all of these challenges that is the Salton Sea. We've since worked on multiple, multiple projects at a range of scales to try to shift the approach to the sea restoration to include not just restoration of habitat, but also addressing the severe environmental health impacts on the residents living near the sea. We've worked at the 
<clears throat> we've worked at the uh, level of advocacy to change community engagement protocol at the state level. We've built new data sets through community science efforts like this balloon mapping. We've designed multi-beneficial infrastructure with state parks. And we've worked at the advocacy scale to shift the narrative of who is being impacted by the conditions of the sea by designing a single object, a bingo game, created in partnership with the local high school's art program. Through all of this work at the sea, we saw the need to help build the next generation of local environmental advocates, knowing that a firm like ours couldn't be the voice for an entire community. And the other residents, like the Oasis Leadership Committee, uh, were working on so many issues that they couldn't represent everyone. With this, we launched the Juntos Project. Through it, we're building community power and local youth leadership by working with college students from the area to be the environmental advocates that the community needs. This group recently designed and fabricated this mobile environmental justice hub to meet residents where they are and make it easy for them to get involved in the change efforts. This last cluster is in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Each project in it responds to the challenge of an extreme shortage of land for social infrastructure and safe housing. What's interesting to me about this cluster is that most of these projects appeared at one point to be very straightforward design projects. There was a scope, we would design it, it would get built. At this point in our practice, we should have known better than that because in each project, the work that started to design as something to be designed and implemented converted into a project to develop a new city or countywide programming program, sometime requiring us to change local or state policy along the way. The Play Streets program is one such example. It was designed to bring immediate play access to the half of LA, almost entirely low-income communities of color that doesn't have access to it. But the project also had a second objective as defined by residents. It was a placekeeping effort in communities like Boyle Heights where gentrification is an active presence. Residents designed the things that they wanted to see in a program, the things that represented their culture and their community. They used this program as a way to assert identity, signal their presence, and build community cohesion to organize toward common goals. In the pandemic, a Philly-themed box of play was commissioned for their Play Streets program. But the Play Streets program was always meant to act as a stopgap measure on the road to permanent public spaces. So as we were working on this project, we were also asking how to create those permanent spaces more quickly and affordably than the standard process allowed. We saw an opportunity, again, borrowing from all that we had learned in Kibera, in the more than 2,000 vacant lots that the city owns. The trouble was that no one exactly knew which lots be be belonged to which agency, and there was no way for the public to access them anyway. So with a group of five other organizations, many of whom we worked with on play streets, we decided to first stage short-term activations, like this one, to demonstrate to elected officials the potential for vacant lots to become community-serving assets. It worked. We were able to pass a motion through city council and launch a pilot program through which community groups could adopt city-owned vacant lots like these for up to two years while working to make the space into a permanent public space. To activate the adopted lots, we designed the plane, the basic element of a kit of parts that can be assembled in different ways to facilitate a variety of uses. Residents would decide on which uses were most important to them through a, a participatory design process and transform a lot like this into first a temporary public space like this and ultimately, as is the case in this lot, uh, go on to purchase the space with a partner like a neighborhood land trust, which is 
who will own the, who now owns this space and then develop it into a permanent public space making sure that that five year timeline that typically exists for a public space to come online is shorter but also filling it with access to public space along temporary public space along the way there are many cities across the state looking for similar pathways to create more public space in their high density, high need communities. And so this project has had a surprising amount of interest. So we've scaled it up to the state level and we've just begun working with two cities with another potentially on the way to help them deliver similar programs. With Play Streets and Adopt-A-Lot underway, and with our same partner that has that worked with all of these worked on all of these projects with us we were called to help them with a design challenge in another contested public space in LA the sidewalks there are over 12,000 street vendors in LA that fuel our city and activate our public realm and yet until 2018 when our coalition succeeded in decriminalizing street vending Vendors were being harassed and fined for providing us these services. After legalization, that was supposed to end, but it didn't. Vendors were still being fined and harassed. This time, the reason, their carts were not code compliant. So to address this, we're working at the furniture scale to design a code compliant street cart. Seemed pretty straightforward, but what we learned right away as we quickly got into the massing studies was the reason that the carts weren't compliant was because to do so would mean creating carts that were too big to fit on any sidewalk in LA and too expensive for any street vendor to afford. These were rules designed for brick and mortar establishments that had been sloppily labeled as also rules for street vending. So as a coalition, we had to pivot to the policy scale for a minute to change state regulations and create the conditions within which a just design was possible. SB Bill 972 passed in 2002, and we're now finalizing the permitting process for a code compliant grill cart that should go into prototyping imminently. This work is to change the dynamics on, seed, on sidewalks for vendors for pedestrians and for shop owners too. And then a final project, one working to combat displacement, the LA County Land Bank. Together with LA County and all the same partners that have worked on every project I've mentioned in this cluster, we're now building a process by which the county can establish its first land bank for affordable housing development. The project is in very early stages, but our first step is to create a data-driven and community-informed system for identifying the most impactful parcels. And we made it through all the projects, and we still have a few minutes left. I hope that this gives you a sense of the myriad ways in which designers can facilitate a transition to a more just public realm across multiple geographies, scales, challenges, and topics. And so now as we prepare to move into the discussion portion of the evening, I want to return to this idea of a different mode of practice for a moment. I often ask myself, usually before a lecture like this, where I am about to assert that we are a different mode of practice, if in fact our practice really is that different. I can't say I have a definitive answer to the question. Sometimes I think we look just like any other practice a friend or colleague is running and other times it looks totally opposite. But if I ever have a moment to contemplate all of our projects in the portfolio at once, there are at least three things that define our different mode of practice today. The first is how we define the projects. When I look at all of our projects over all of time, I can confidently say that less than a quarter of them could have come through a traditional client designer commission or an agency RFP. And only a handful have, or even ever could have, come online through something like a design competition. 
The standard design levers just don't move well in places where our work is focused. And yet for every project we've done, there have been all of the baseline elements in place needed for a good project. A very clear demand, strong resident support for a project, and the availability of resources, both human and capital, to get the work done. So KDI practices as a navigator. We work as a team trained to connect systems, scales, and resources to assist these efforts that are already underway by residents and connect them to the design and planning machines that have harmed or overlooked them for too long. These projects happen because a group of people trained to think across these scales are there by their side and catalyzing change. But since traditional firm economics don't support these types of complex project development processes, we've also had to take a different approach to how we pay for the projects, including our work on them. So these are the things typically covered by a project budget that comes via an RFP. And these are all of the other things that KDI typically needs to do to get the most urgent work done. So structuring ourselves as a nonprofit allows us to tap into other revenue streams that can support this expanded, more community-directed design process. Not from time to time, when extra time or profit allows, but full-time, because we believe the scale of the disparities require full-time attention. And the last key difference is the one I've spent the most time on this evening, how we follow the projects. Where some firms see small-scale projects as a road to the ultimate destination of very large-scale projects, our work requires that we retain a willingness and ability to work at all scales at all times. And it's because it's always a possibility that something at the scale of creating a bingo game is the most direct path to a just public realm. And finally, with our differences out of the way, the point I'd like to leave you with is that you don't have to be different to make a difference. You can, find, you can do this work wherever you find yourself. I say this because I truly believe that any firm, not just the nonprofit ones, can and should ask with every project they take on, regardless of scope or client, how can we ensure that this project, in its own small way, contributes to a more just public realm? If it's a park, a plaza, a civic space, have we ensured that it will be equitably accessible and welcoming to everyone? If it's a streetscape or a transit network, has this project made it easier for entirely new groups of people to access opportunity? or have we only made it better for those who already have access? If it's an environmental remediation project, will the new safe and healthy space first and foremost benefit those that have had to endure the negative consequences of that environmental hazard for so long? Or will it serve those that are coming to the space only after it has been invested in? In this way, with these questions, we can all broaden our modes of practice, whatever kind of practice we are in. Beyond practices that create when invited by RFP or a client call, to practices that also catalyze when needed. Zip codes shape life expectancy, and designers shape zip codes. I encourage all of us to think of that with every line we lay on the screen, every plan we make in our studios, and with every plant that we plant on our planet. Thank you. All right, these are on. Thank you. That Thank was you. great. Thanks. Um, so we're, we have plenty of time, too, which is also great. You like kept to time, and we, we have. She cut a whole cluster. She cut a whole cluster. So the clusters, let's start with the clusters. Um, 
So I, so what I really appreciate about your work and the presentation of it is that you don't see each project as just a sort of a project unto itself, but you see it as a point along a line, a trajectory of change that you're thinking multi-scalar, you're thinking um, multi-jurisdictional or multi sort of um, uh, sort of constituency. Um, and, and so I think that that kind of, you know, when you think about how your practice is different and you were sort of trying to conceptualize that, um, what came to mind for me was social justice brokers, right? You're kind of like bringing all of these entities together to, to advance social agendas. Um, folks who have ideas and have passion but don't have access and folks who have power and capital but don't have inspiration or, or the ability to execute on um, the now sort of commonplace uh, um, uh, lexicon of racial and social justice, which we do see in RFPs now coming out, but people don't know what that really means. Um, and, you know, I guess I want to know from you first, before we open it up, is since you're not working sort of from a traditional point of departure, and but you are impacting sort of traditional spaces, right? You're impacting the way that um, Nairobi is thinking about road infrastructure as sort of multifunctional. You're impacting, you know, you're, you're taking a, a, a situation where, you know, if there aren't sidewalks, you can't have bus stops. So if it's bad, make it worse kind of policies. Um, and actually leading to look doing a full shade study and a shade plan, a different way of thinking about things. Um, so what can we do if we are in working in the public sector um, or we are working with people in public sector through those traditional channels to get them to better lay the groundwork for that kind of thing to happen so that it doesn't have to be a nonprofit group that like has this, these ideas and there's a couple of you and, but we all can't do it kind of thing. Um, so what, what do we need to do in industry to change? Um, and then what can, advice can you give to designers, young designers and, and students um, who have this kind of passion, but maybe see these paths as these dots, there's five dots, and you can just go from one to another, but it's not actually that easy. What, what advice can you give folks? Um, so industry change, and then uh, sort of words of wisdom. Okay. Well, the four dots were my advice for how to do it, so now I've got to come up with another answer. But, okay, starting with the um, industry and what the industry can do to change. I mean, this is the question we were asking ourselves at the beginning of many of these projects because we didn't think we had any uh, out of the ordinary leverage because we were a nonprofit. In fact, quite the opposite. So we were asking, like, you know, how can we influence this, these big machines that have no reason to take notice of us? Um, and have no reason to change their complex bureaucratic structures to do something else. And I think the thing that we found most successful, and it's kind of one of these lessons learned um, when anyone asks me to kind of say, say what we've learned along the way, is that there's a real power in what I call uh, cultivating carrots. And what I mean by that is we have something that we think of as like a, a seed fund at KDI. Um, and it started with that project in North Shore that I showed, where we knew that the reason parks weren't getting built is because the traditional structure of financing for parks was tied to kind of tax base. And in the rural farm worker communities, the numbers weren't adding up. So we saw an opportunity to kind of have a point of leverage by, by entering there. And we said to the parks department that actually was totally fine and willing to put parks there, they just didn't have a mechanism. We said, okay, let's, let's make you a deal. What if we figure out how to fund this park construction? We'll design it, we'll deliver it to you, you don't pay us a thing, but if we do it, you have to agree to take that park into your portfolio permanently and maintain it and program it and service it the way that you do all other pro projects. 
they agreed, and that really has become something we've done over and over again. By giving people carrots or ways to lower their risk at the point of entry, uh, you can get, people are willing, especially individuals within these agencies that are hard to move, are willing to give things a try. And that project was a great example because you know, their, their first agreement was to just take it over once we had done all the hard work. But as we brought them into the process, they ended up doing so much more. They did bring some financial resources to the project. They ended up changing their RFP process for subsequent parks that used our same financing model to a community engaged process and so many other things. So we were able to kind of change the uh, machinery at the public scale by acting at a very specific point along the path and really by like making it hard for people to say no. That's, that's a great answer. So the second one, uh, yes, you have your four points. <laughs> for many of the students here, um, they, are, they are going to move into their own practice. But for as many of them, there are also students that will move into firms and into um, sort of uh, you know, public practice. Um, so maybe for those other ones. So the, you've gave a chart for the folks who are going to be entrepreneurial um, immediately out the gate. Um, but for those who are going to, you know, when I graduated, I went and worked at Sasaki Associates. So like that was more a traditional path. But it wasn't. I didn't necessarily. I wasn't making my own destiny in, in that space. Um, I was learning a lot, but it wasn't. It's a different path. So for those, for the me's out of school, um, what what advice do you have? Yeah, I think it maybe is advice similar to what I closed with. I think that um, as a person just starting out or someone who stays at Sasaki or other great firms and kind of rises up through the through the ranks, you are working on, you have, a, there's always a point at which you can influence a project, no matter what your role on the project is. And I really think that in whatever moment you have influence over, there is a way to begin to shift the outcome toward justice. Some of the examples I closed with are, are but a few of the ways. But I think it's about having that mindset. You know, after a lecture like this, students always come up to me and say, like, are you hiring? And, and if you're not, who else does what you do? But as you said, the reality is there are not that many of us, and we aren't always hiring. So I tell students, you know, a version of what I closed with that, but that doesn't mean you have to kind of forego getting into the work of design as justice or wait until we have a job opening. You just need to look for those levers of influence. And you need to follow some of those same four steps. Find the like-minded people within Sasaki. You were there. I'm sure you, with all of your work, tried to find those moments and were probably successful at it. So a, a person starting out, find someone like you in a big firm. And there's two points of influence on any given project. And as you build those internal coalitions, um, you can really begin to take every opportunity that each project presents to do something um, in a more justice-driven way. And use your time here to start practicing that mindset. That's, that's what you have space to do. Um, let's take some questions. Anyone have questions? If you raise your hand, I think Mike's come. Or do I bring the mic? Oh, no, Mike's come. OK. First here, and then you can Thanks. take the next one. Um, so how do you pay for the park in the first place? Do you have independent <laughs> wealth that none of us know about? Well, there's something else I want to share. No, I don't. 100% um, no. Um, th that was the, being a nonprofit is how we pay for it. And that, there's more to the answer than that, but that's the first framework because but as a nonprofit, we can tap into other revenue streams that a for-profit firm has a harder time doing. And some of those revenue streams are things like um, state and federal grants. 
So active transportation grants from the Department of Transportation, EPA, uh, local grants in California, there are the um, conservancies that kind of have different jurisdictions throughout the state. And all of these are really good vehicles for defining your own project. They're pots of money oftentimes that, you know, now that we're, we've been around for a while and we're doing this work, those pots of money always want to be focused on the highest need communities, but they're very like obscure to navigate. So the highest need communities don't have the staff, they don't have the time, they don't have the capacity to navigate those systems. And so the people that usually uh, are able to access those pots are the people that need it least. So we have um, found, learned how to navigate those systems, but also sort of cultivated relationships to the point that now some of those agencies sort of call us and say, like, do you have a project? Do you have, a, do you have things you're working on? The next round is opening here. Um, so that's one big source of funding. It's taken us time to really get in the rhythm of that, and those pots of money come with their own challenges because they're bureaucratic, they're state funds, they're subject to political swings, but that's one option. The other, of course, is foundations. Um, you know, I really am sad I had to cu cut my gender cluster, but I wanted to in service of this discussion. But there's some project, there are two projects, one of which started here at the GSD uh, that started with a studio that Diane invited me to teach with the World Bank. Uh, along with the World Bank, we did a little bit of extra work for them to de design a process to be used by the um, Argentine government at the national level, a process for gender inclusive design and informal settlements. And that work, uh, was successful with the studio. We were able to bring students to work on a specific gender inclusive uh, park design in an informal settlement in Mendoza. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Um, and that project, surprisingly, because I don't think this is a norm for studio projects, um, was picked up by the municipality through some of their own kind of funding mechanisms and community members voted on the six student projects. One was selected, it was designed and built, and now there's the first gender inclusive public space um, in, in Argentina designed by GSD students. But the point of that is to get to the foundations. So that work became a stepping stone. The World Bank called us a few months later, said, you know, could you write some guidelines like you did for Argentina, for the whole world? We said, oh yeah, that sounds totally possible. <laughs> um, and, you know, they had no money to do it. They said, oh, it should be, you know, like a 30-page document. If the it World Bank's out of money, we're in trouble. <laughs> It ended up being a 300-page document. You know, it did like there was the budget was nowhere near what it needed to be done. But and this is where I get to the foundations. All of that work, starting from the studio at the GSD, positioned us really well to say that we had been developing a certain body of expertise, and foundations, more than anything, want to see that. So there's, um, so from that work, we've done several other uh, projects really rooted in gender-inclusive design, funded by foundations looking to us because of this sort of depth of expertise. So foundations is another, another way we do it. And then the last one I'll say is, um, I really think that you don't have to take the RFP at face value. So we started experimenting early on with the idea of like, well, what if we just kind of rewrote the RFP back to the city or client or you know issuer of it? And uh, surprisingly, like it worked a time or two, and that has sort of created this other path of. Um, I guess I would say helping cities know where to put their money um, before they put the RFPs in place. And so in that way, you can kind of create 
the revenue stream that you need to exist um, and then tap into it once it gets there. Yeah, Sorry, I that's mean, a I, long answer. <laughs> I think, I mean, just to sort of tack on the sort of rewriting the RFP, um, oftentimes you'll find that there are people on the client team that actually share your critique <laughs> of the RFP itself. Um, and so by being straightforward, you can identify those people. If they don't hire you, you didn't want that job anyway because you saw it in a certain way and they didn't, that would be a very painful process. Um, so I, I also take that strategy and, and then when you lose, then you know that that wasn't the right fit anyway. Uh, next question. And then we have one down here in the front, Diane. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, it was a great presentation. My name is uh, Brandon German. Uh, I have a two part question, one, you spoke about uh, when you take only smaller projects, you have to go in and sometimes change policy, advocate for uh, changes. How long is this taking you? And two, uh, as a social impact firm, I know you're going for funding for these projects, but how is the firm making money? Uh, because sometimes these foundations, right, that doesn't go to like the firm for payout to employees and profit, correct? It does actually. Okay. That's something if you if you work with good foundations that are kind of have an evolved understanding of how nonprofits work, which many do at this point or are trying to, um, you can, you know, put together a project budget the way you would for a private client that called and put that, pro pass that project budget on to a foundation um, or to any other potential funding stream. <clears throat> so our work, when, when we go to a foundation or a grant source for funding, it's not just to build the project, it's also to um, cover our work in facilitating the project. That said, I think just one thing, one way that I think we are similar to any design firm, someone said to me uh, not too long ago when I, it was at a, a for-profit firm, a very successful one, and I said, oh, we're structured as a nonprofit uh, design firm, and the, the person said, oh, aren't, aren't all de design firms nonprofits? <laughs> And so, you know, the reality is, is that even with foundation money and all of these different revenue streams, there is still the constant pressure that any designer in this room knows all too well of trying to keep a project to a budget that is almost always insufficient to begin with, especially when you're trying to lead a process that extends beyond that kind of small blue zone that I showed in one of the last slides. Um, so that's a reality. Your other, you had another question. The, can you remind me the first question? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the policy, that that's the other thing. Um, I wish I could say that this work is fast, but it isn't. Um, and particularly because of all those other pieces, you know, the, the last cluster I showed, all of those projects kind of started as, oh, this is a nine month project. We already legalized street vending. All you have to do is come in and design the cart, get a fab find a fabricator to work with, and, you know, we'll build the first one, test it with vendors, and then we'll build 200 of them. I don't know, that was like three years ago. Um, and not because anybody has taken their foot off the gas for even one second. It's because you take one step, you realize, oh, these codes are completely impossible. Then you need to launch a whole advocacy campaign. You need to get a Senate bill on the register. And that can add another year to the project right there just to get back to that the same step that you were already at. So the projects do really take you know, a long time, but that's where, another way that we're different is this sort of rooted in place model. And we do work in in between places and do kind of projects that, you know, are one time in one place, but that's, that's the exception, not the rule. Because to do the work in any of the clusters I showed, you just have to stick around and you have to build, the, you know, each project needs to build on each other, not just in terms of how, like the physical scale of the projects, but the relationship 
scale of the projects. And you know, you can only change policies or get a motion passed by city council because you are working with the same folks on a different project uh, in, in a different part of the city. So they do take a lot, a long time, but it's all, everything's so fluid that it doesn't feel like, you know, it's just, those, all those steps are just happening in the background and projects kind of have their way of, one rises to a peak moment while another is, I don't know, trying to write a Senate bill and vice versa. And, and you know, the, the process that is central to your work, which is centering community voice and community agency, requires community trust of you <laughs> as, a, as a consultant or a facilitator or a broker. Um, and so being very place-based is a way for you to sort of show evidence that you're committed for the long run and you're not just jumping in and jumping out, so. Absolutely. Um, Diane. By the way, this is like the best front row ever. <laughs> you just make me smile yeah. seeing uh, all of love you. The love is just about to start because <laughs> I'm just going to say what an amazing presentation and your work is so inspiring and it's always, I always love hearing more about it. This was really a, there's so many things in my mind. So I want to make two comments, kind of pull out things you've already said just for the whole audience here that I think stick in my mind about the importance of, of the kind of accumulated work you've done, the kind of principles that people can carry forward when they graduate from here. But also, and then I have one question. But the, the first comment has to do with um, thinking about, well, it's related I was going to ask at first, and one of your responses was about, you know, don't take the RFP too seriously. So the second comment that I was going to make that is in, in that same domain was uh, the ways in which when you talked about the park project and that you said, we'll do this thing for you, we'll give it to the park system, you don't have to pay for it, we'll do the whole thing as long as you promise to carry it forward. It makes me think a little bit about a project that Stephen and I worked on, the High Line, the ways in which they did all the work but they still didn't ask the city to continue to do it. So my point, the comment here, what I love about your work is not just the confidence in the design that you know you're doing the right thing, but the kind of the insurgent confidence. <laughs> you really are coming at it that, that the traditional ways of doing design miss the equity questions and you have to not only have confidence, because a lot of designers have confidence, <laughs> but confidence in the insurgency of what you're doing. And I think that, was, that comes through in both of those examples. The second comment that I think is really important, well, I think it's important because I work on governance, is um, the idea you gave a couple examples of design. I'm thinking about the, the street vending carts. The ways in which once you start the design process, you not only understand, but you reveal the problems with the regulation. And, and this is where the relationship between design and planning is very important, but you need a really good designer, an insurgent designer, and a good design process to reveal to the state or authorities that, that there's the problem. Now, one could say that a traditional firm doesn't do that because they play in the rules. But you, by being insurgent, I'm sorry, I'm gonna come back to that, you actually reveal what's wrong with the way we've set up the rules. Mm -hmm. So I think everything you've done is amazing. My question is a little, I, and maybe it's too, too kind of nerdy because I'm working in regionalism these days, but I, you've emphasized a lot the network. And the network worked in Kibera, it worked in the Coachella Valley, it, you talk, talked about it a little bit in LA, but it didn't feel like it was working the same way in That's LA right. that it worked in Coachella Valley and that it worked in Cabrera. And in fact, you used the word regional when you talked about Coachella Valley. So I wondered if you could reflect a little bit more because on what you mean by a network and how much of that is a territoriality of thinking about um, linking projects in space as opposed to linking projects in terms of mobilizing ideas and people. And if you had any thoughts for us here, students, about how we work through the territorial and the social 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. And well, I could make a lot of comments, but I want to answer the question before I forget it. Um, I think I inten intentionally or knowingly use this idea of network in many ways because it that is how it comes up for our work. Sometimes we do mean a very physical network, like the public space network in Kibera. That it, these, these are spaces that are physically connected, the leadership groups are connected, the resources are connected, and, and that does apply to several of our networks. But then there's the network of a, yeah, a topic or a theme and or a, a kind of line of work that is thematic, like the gender work. And there's a, that, that cluster. And actually, that's why I wanted to share that gender cluster, because it's not geographically connected. It's a place in Argentina, the world, Los Angeles, Los Angeles City, then, Lo then Los Angeles County. Um, but but I see that that pattern of linking is it's essential to all of our work. It, linking physically, linking ideologically, linking politically, and so the network, the idea of a network does kind of um, exist at multiple in multiple ways throughout our practice. Um, in LA, uh, this is something we think about a lot. You know, folks that work in our LA office, um, including myself, we always sort of, um, I think, romanticize the power of the networks in places like Coachella and Kivera. And with good reason. You have these great, you know, I have friends and colleagues that I've been working with in these places for 15 years, you know, and and to kind of see that power. I, I gave, a, gave a talk at Columbia on Tuesday just on this Oasis Leadership Committee. And in preparing for it, you know, I was finding these photos of women that we've been working with for a decade who brought their kids to every community meeting when they were five and six. And 10 years later, now they're in that Juntos group. And there's pictures of like them growing up. So in LA, people always say, like, well, I want to work on the Kibera network. I want to work on the Coachella Valley network. And what we sort of said is, well, what's the equivalent here? Because in LA, we work in many different communities in the same way where we stick around for a long time. But the, it's micro communities. It might be at the scale of one public housing project on the west side, where we've been working for four years. But that's um, that isn't going to be networked in the same way with a community group that we've been working with in Watts, which is ten miles away, and we've been working. So we've started to work on this idea that we're or this. I don't know, body of work that we call radical resident collectives that sort of allows there to be these, um, those types of relationships and projects at a much smaller physical scale that might exist alongside a similar set of projects and people you know, in the same city that can have relationships with each other, learning exchanges, et cetera, but that we aren't that, but so that we aren't trying to kind of force this idea of a network that works better in smaller places or in places with different governance structures onto a place like LA. That's great. Um, oh, and by the way, the Highline work that we did was an intellectual project. Diane and I did not design the Highline. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, over here. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, which part of the community-based design is critical for you? For so, from your uh, lecture, I see that mostly problem solving or answering the questions. But I want to see the other sides. If times allows. Yeah. Do you mean the other sides, like when it all goes wrong? Because that, I mean, that happens on every project. <laughs> um, here's one idea. I don't know if this answers your question, so tell me if, is it, if it doesn't. But it's one thing I've been thinking about a lot. Um, first, I always try to give a disclaimer in a talk like this. I'm going to share 
15 projects with you, they're going to sound like they're all perfect. Like they just, you have a problem, you solve it, on to the next one. And it just, it doesn't happen that way. But there's not enough time in a talk like this to tell you about those things. So there's my disclaimer. Um, but to the, to, oops, to the question of, um, you know, like what's the other side? Something we try to consistently critique our own work, particularly around these terms like these ubiquitous terms like community engagement or community driven process. You know, everybody, everybody can lay claim to that now. So, what does it mean for us? And if any planners are in this room that know the um, Arnstein ladder of participation, there's this you know upper quadrant that's the good quadrant. Um, but even within that quad, or quad, it's not a quadrant, but the upper three rungs of, of that ladder. Um, I'm forgetting exactly the names, but the, the third one is like probably where any really good community driven uh, practitioner gets to. But there's still these two other elusive rungs on the ladder, the top of which is citizen control, I think it's called. And so our work now and we, I'm not saying we've done it. I'm not saying like we, you know, have have all the pathways to get there. But but in the place where we're trying to push ourselves, it's to get to that citizen control. And the best example we have of it so far, some of our work in Kibera, but but because of the way that land tenure and things are structured in Kibera, there's so many forces outside of our power to control that I think keeps us from getting to that place on some of our projects. But in the Coachella Valley, this Oasis Leadership Committee, I think is, is kind of the best place where we have been able to really push ourselves to push this process into something that's meaningful to, to critique our own process and, and say, you know, where are we just kind of still continuing to lead where it's really time for us to you know take the back seat and i think this shade equity master plan is signals a first uh, kind of a, a first new level for us in that project uh, we um, applied you know for a state grant and the way that we that that group is um, listed in that project is in the same way that KDI or the Research Institute at UCLA is listed. They have their own scope. They're their own independent partner. And, and to me, that's where we are aiming with the work. It's really hard to get there, especially in geographies like LA, where you're spread out. But I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I mean, full, full of failures and challenges, which are the things we learn from and the things that make the projects strong. Um, it's really an incremental process, right? You, you can't do all of the stuff in the first project. You do something, and then you prove concept, and then you build on that in the next, and it's kind of an incremental thing, and that doesn't sound exciting. So let's call it radical incrementalism. <laughs> um, but um, no, this has been really fantastic. We've actually had time to have a conversation, which sometimes doesn't happen at these talks. Um, so I just want to thank you again, Shalina, for a really great dialogue, a really great presentation, um, and uh, let you know that you will be here for a little bit of time if you guys want to come down and talk to Shalina after the talk um, in a more focused way. But thank you so much. Thanks for having me.